The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its stories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, the design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. 
It is a mine of wealth, health to the soul, and a river of pleasure. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Pray it in, read it through, live it out, and pass it on. Good morning. This is Pastor George Mims, Church of the Living God in Pittsburgh, California. We feel so blessed and fortunate to have you to join us today. We're really excited about the word that the Lord has put in my heart to be able to share with you. And so uh, before we go into that word, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity and this moment to be able to come before you. God, you clothed us in your righteousness. You put glory on top of us. You, you allow us to walk in the blessings that you bestowed upon us. And I just pray right now that you open the hearts and the minds of those that are listening, that are watching today, that they may hear a word, that they may feel the answer to prayers that they've rendered up to you. God, we just thank you for this opportunity and I ask that you help me to minimize as you maximize, that I may speak your words and not my own, that you might receive glory and not myself. We ask these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen, 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 amen. We are really excited, um, you know, definitely to be able to come back a, another week again with you. Um, I know yesterday many of you all celebrated uh, the July 4th celebration. Maybe you got off work on Friday. Uh, always appreciated those extra days when they came. Uh, but it seems like the older I get, the more that I enjoy the fellowship and the food more than the fireworks. But I pray that everyone where you are um, enjoyed a safe um, and just sort of a, a prosperous and relaxing uh, fellow, a holiday filled with fellowship. Um, you know, whether you celebrate the 4th of July or not, um, that day is a day of sacrifice. Um, whether you're looking at, you know, slaves and butlers in the field or the frontline entrymen uh, during that 1776 time period, um, where, wherever people were, they were sacrificing not just for themselves, but for those that would come behind them. Um, these last four Sundays, we've been going through the book of St. Luke. Uh, St. Luke, the great physician, as people know him by. And um, the book of Luke inextricably focuses a lot of his message and the teachings of Christ around the marginalized and the dispossessed, those people that are on the edges of society, those people that are often overlooked or overshadowed. And so the gospel is presented in the book of St. Luke is presented in very clear fashion to, to present really a message of Jesus for everybody. Hear me what I'm saying. Jesus didn't come just for the rich or for the poor. He didn't come just for the black or the white or the Asian. He came that all might be saved. That is the desire that we see in John 6 and 40. Um, but, but again, we know that everybody's not going to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, when I th we think about this, this you know, message that we see in St. Luke, I am thoroughly convinced that people don't struggle with the readings in Luke or the teachings of Christ because they don't believe Jesus was, was, was you know, the Son of God or they don't believe that he was born in a manger or you know, was crucified, was risen and ascend, ascended to the right hand of the Father. I believe that we struggle with these things because we draw lines as to how far we're willing to go to serve him. I think we, we, I think we, we, we desire in our hearts all the things that the, the Bible talks about and the bounty of blessings. But I think we struggle because we put conditions on our worship. We put conditions expecting people to reciprocate before we move in advance in the places where God calls us. Here, here's what I mean. You know, when we fill out these questionnaires sometimes, they'll ask you, what is your faith? What is your religion? And we'll, we'll, we'll boldly and courageously see it as a profession of our faith to check off the box that says, box that says Christian. But yet we won't take Jesus fully into the workplace 
to allow him to govern how we deal with coworkers or maybe managers that we don't get along with. And, and so we, we see that. People will bring their Bibles to church and, and say, I got the weapon of, of, of the sword of the word of God with me. But yet when we take those Bibles home, where we spend most of our time, where we have most of our interactions, the Bible becomes more of a paperweight or table ornament. We prescribe Jesus as the medicine that heals all diseases and cures all afflictions. But yet if anyone were to survey our compliance to the prescription of Jesus in our own lives, it might be shaky or inconsistent at best. So, so what am I saying? You say, Pastor, okay, I hear you, but what am I saying? What I'm saying very plainly is that if you intend to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. Let me say that again. If you intend to walk on water, you must first get out of the boat. If you expect God to be the head of your finances, then you must be willing to present whatever little that you have to, for, to God as a starting place so that he can multiply it as he sees fit. You know, if you, if, you, if you look to say, God, I want you to come in and to, to, to live in my heart and let the spirit reign in my life, then you and I must possess the courage to evict the old man and the old woman out of our lives. We must, we must separate ourselves from the old ways of how you and I may have dealt with things in the past. We now live as, as what the scriptures say, as a bond servant. We live as slaves, but not slaves in the traditional sense that we think about it, but we live as slaves to a king that desires to satisfy us with good and with mercy. I remember me reading years ago, uh, Joni Erickson Tata. She's a young lady, um, I think around 76. She might have been 17 years old. And uh, just through a bad uh, scuba diving accident, she became a quadriplegic. So she lost all activity of her limbs, both arms and legs, and she was confined to a wheelchair. And, and Joni, if you ever read her story, she talks about those years after the accident where she struggled with bouts of depression and she had challenges trying to really live with this new norm. But, but, but you see, the, the, the Word of God and the Spirit allowed her to begin to share her testimony, share her story, to the point where it began to resonate with people that had gone through similar circumstances or that were taking care of people that were disabled. Joni's ministry exploded in this new norm, this, this, you know, what seemed like, okay, this is the end of her life, was actually the beginning of her ministry. She started a ministry of Joni and friends, and, and she started making wheelchairs for people all around the world that either couldn't afford it or didn't uh, have access to be able to get wheelchairs to the point that they've given over 100,000 wheelchairs away free of no charge to the people that, that most needed it all around the world. She, she was instrumental in the Americans with Di Disabilities Act and the passing of that by our Congress years ago. And she even involved the prisoners in helping to make uh, wheelchairs and to refurbish wheelchairs as part of their service and debt to society. But it also was a witnessing point for those that didn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to meet him through Joni's story. You see, when I think about Joni's story, it's a really powerful story. And, and, and you know what? I'm no Superman. I am mortal just like everyone else. And I, I wonder, you know, would I be able to do the same thing? I think about the magnitude of losing everything that I may think is normal and now saying, OK, God, use me in my new state. I wonder, you know, would I, would I be able to deal with that or would I still be in a place of depression? Here, here's what I want to ask you, those that are watching today. Where are you? Have you drawn lines in, 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 in the ground and say, you know what, I'm going to serve God all the way up to this line? Or there are some people that Jesus is calling me to forgive or to go and to restore. But God, I'm just not ready. I, I've, gr I've grown up in church all my life and I would hear people say that, you know what, God is still working on me. And, and they would say it really more as an excuse than what, it, what, what was really actually going on. Yes, God is working on all of us. But sometimes we throw that out because we're not ready to move in the place that God is actually calling us to. I'm grateful that the Lord has left a message, a remnant, a seed for us to be able to allow to be planted in our hearts today, that it might germinate into a life of fulfillment, a life that is encompassed around living for Christ fully, not just, just in some kind of, you know, total despair, but in the joy that the Bible says that, you know, that, that joy that surpasses all understanding, that, that, that excitement, that life. 
You see, our scripture this morning, I want to set it up, is going to be coming from the book of St. Luke. Again, we've been in Luke for the last four weeks. We're not going to go to the scriptures yet, but we're going to be in Luke, um, the fifth chapter. And let me kind of frame it up before we actually go to the focal verse. See, you, when we talk about Luke, Luke, again, is written to the marginalized and the dispossessed. And so we see this story, you know, in the fifth chapter, and, and, and the Bible says that there was a man that was, was sick of the palsy. He was, a, he was a quadriplegic. He was a paraplegic. He was, he was basically confined to a bed that he would lay on. And in that bed, the Bible says that there were four men that were carrying him, and they carried him to the place where Jesus was speaking. And, 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 and they tried to go and get him in front of Jesus via the conventional routes, like doorways or possibly a windowway. Maybe they could, can lower him into the window. But when they didn't find conventional ways to get the man in front of Jesus, that the Bible says that they took him to the rooftop and they began to tear off the roof. They began to, 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 to really just try to get this man in front of Christ. We look in verse 18 and the Bible says that we see the intentions of the people. They said that if we can get him in front of Christ, then he would be healed. And, and so imagine Jesus sitting in a room and he's teaching people, standing room capacity. And all of a sudden you look up and they see embers and splinters dropping out of the ceiling. Hey, and they look up and the Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, he looked up and saw the faith of the ones that were lowering him. Not the one that was being carried, but the one that was lowering him. The Bible says that he saw their faith and he healed the man. Which brings us to our focal verse. And we only have two verses that we're going to look at. Just two verses here. And, and this is what happens after that scene. And it says this, verse 25. Immediately he stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went to his home glorifying God. Verse 26 and final verse. Verse 26 says this. Verse 26 says, Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen strange things today. Let me read that again. Verse 26 says, Amazement seized all of them. Everybody that was in the house seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen strange things today. Wow, imagine the scene. Imagine being in that house and seeing all of a sudden this commotion coming through the rooftop and seeing this man lowered down. Who cannot be inspired by that? Who, who, man, who would, I, I can feel the, the, the hair on my arm standing up even as I recall the story, as if I was there. But, but, but there are a couple of observations that I want to be able to, to give you and really kind of point out. I encourage you, however, to read the full passage. The Bible says that you and I are to, to go and to, to read the word, to live by every word of God. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, which we find in our text. So read that, that full passage. But, but here's one of the observations that I want to share with you this morning that's, that's on my heart. That the man, in order to be healed, had to first be willing to be carried. Let me say that again. In order for him to get his healing, he had to be vulnerable in order to be carried by four other men. That's powerful. I really want you to let that sink in for a moment. You see, many of us, we, we, we pray to God and we will call down heaven and we'll, we'll select people to pray for us. But, but, but the question is... Are we really fully transparent before God? Sometimes we, we, we choose who we want to pray for us, but, but we don't want to put our business out there. And I understand that sometimes, you know, people use information for ill gain or they use it to sort of tear us down. But, but you see that if God goes before us, then who, he's more than the world against us. So if the Lord is orchestrating the, that, that everything, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He says that the Bible says that the heart of the king is in the Lord's hands. It ebbs and flows as the Lord sees fit. So, so if, if things are happening, it's happening while God sits on the throne. But if you and I are doing it for his glory, then he'll be glorified. We don't have to worry about the adversary. We don't have to worry about the enemy. We don't have to be concerned about those things. You and I are called to just go and to serve him fully. 
We read in James chapter 5, verse 16, that the Bible says that the prayers of the righteous, it has much power and it's, it's effective. It, it, the, the King James says it availeth much. In other words, it makes a lot of room. When you and I pray, when the righteous pray, it's explosive and powerful to the point that things happen. But you see, in order to understand that, you got to look at the A clause of that 16th verse. It says, confess your sins one to another, pray for one another, and that you might be healed. You see, what James is saying is that, yes, the prayers of the righteous, when we intercede and pray for others, God hears our prayers and we can pray in general and God will bless specifically. But, but you see, James was talking about there's power when you and I could, could be truthful and transparent and vulnerable with one another, that we may share what we're asking God for so that when we pray for one another, healing might come about. So when we pray for one another, that room and effectiveness and power might go forth out of our prayers. I, I point that out because the man in Luke chapter 5, he had to be very vulnerable. These, these four brothers are carrying him probably, <clears throat> excuse me, before the presence of people that, that talked about him. The scriptures doesn't say how long this man was on this bed, but I'm sure there were people that maybe have stepped over him at a time or two in order to get to the temple. Nobody had considered him and walked, left him by the wayside while they would go and do things in order to serve, serve God or to show reverence to the Lord. How many people in that room when Jesus was preaching have seen this man before and, and, and the Bible says they were in awe. How many? The thing that I, I bring to your attention is that in order for him to be blessed, to get before Christ, he couldn't walk by himself, but he had to be willing to be carried. The scriptures are silent as to whether he was, was screaming and shouting and resisting them taking him there. The Bible says nothing about that. It simply says that he was Lord. And when Jesus saw their faith, he responded, you must be vulnerable. You got to be open. You got to give God everything in order to receive all the things that God has intended. And so it's important that you and I do that. Here's a second observation that, 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 I, that I put before you. And I really want you to ans ask yourself this question here. How far am I willing to go for Christ? How far am I willing to go for Christ? Here, these brothers lowered this man in. They went up on the rooftop. They didn't do it for themselves. They did it for somebody else. How far are you and I willing to go, not only for ourselves, but for somebody else? The second observation is that Jesus, when he saw their faith, he healed the man that was being carried. They, he didn't point out the faith of the one that was laying on the bed. It was the ones that were carrying him. I, you know, one of the things that, that oftentimes is, is really heartbreaking for me as a shepherd is when I hear people say that bad things happen because their faith was not enough. Sometimes I've, I've, I've prayed and I've, I've counseled loved ones that have lost loved ones that have gone on to glory or just passed away. And, and they bear the scars and the pain and weights of maybe I didn't have enough faith. Maybe if God saw my faith was stronger, maybe he would let grandma live or maybe he would let you know uncle uh, uncle uh, uncle james live or you know maybe this would have happened and so people beat themselves up thinking that it's about an issue of their faith <clears throat> yes god honors our faith but god is not requiring that our faith alone is what's necessary in order for him to heal that's what we see in luke chapter 5 verses 25 and 26 we see the fact that jesus saw their faith we, the, the man that was being carried, <clears throat> maybe his faith wasn't enough. Maybe his faith just wasn't there. or Maybe he never thought that he could get before Jesus because he couldn't walk. He was, he was restricted to the bed. But the Bible says it was their faith. When you look at the story of the founder of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Salvation Army, uh, Salvation Army Shelters, whether we see today, it's been around over 130 years. It started, was started by a preacher back around 1865 over in London. Uh, a preacher that was disgruntled about conventional church or just kind of thought that, you know, it was kind of going through the motions. And so he and his wife, they started to walk the streets of South London and, and really minister to those that were marginalized, that were left out, that were homeless. And, and, and they had a desire to do something more for the people that were restricted, the people that didn't feel like they could come into a church house. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is how 
the Salvation Army shelter started. You see, what, what, what the founder did is he did something not for his own benefit, but it was for somebody else. Imagine the people that live in shelters today. They're living on the blessings and actions, some of them based on something that happened over 130 years ago. Someone else did something. <clears throat> and God saw that effort and began to bless the Salvation Army. We see it today. It started out as a Christian mission. But, 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 but thinking about Jesus' response, he saw the faith of those carrying the man, and that was enough in order for God to heal the man that had laid on the bed for some time. Here's the third thing that I'll leave with you, and it's around answering this question, how far are you willing to go? <clears throat> and that is this. The thing that once carried the man, he was now carrying himself. What, so so, so, so that, that mattress and that, that blanket that he was laying on was the thing that he was now carrying over his shoulder. That, that this was his reality at one point until he met Jesus Christ. And his reality now became an impossibility that was realized. He was now walking where he once laid before. The, the point that I bring this up is that a lot of times we, we, we think about this idea that God heals us. God, God, God delivers us. We pray for good things. <clears throat> but when God comes through, do we go and we share it with somebody else? Or do we share with people the pain and frustration of all the years that people neglected us or that people stepped on us or stepped over us, that they didn't give us just do or didn't recognize our efforts to accomplish whatever work it was? You see, the Bible says that this man went away to his home carrying the thing that once carried him, but he went away rejoicing. <clears throat> the Bible says that there was awe filled by everyone that was in the house as well. You, you ask yourself, when I look at the scriptures, were they in awe of the fact that he now was once laid down, restricted to a mat, and he's now able to walk? Logic would say, yeah, that, that's what they were in awe of. The Bible is silent specifically about the, what they were enamored about. But consider for a moment, maybe they were in awe at the fact of those, three, those four brothers also, that those brothers would go above and beyond to do something that didn't benefit them. That, that in and of itself, we see that today, we're, we're inspired, we sit and we just like, wow, we marvel when somebody does something with no plan for reciprocation, with nothing to gain in return, but they're doing it because the Lord wills them or they do it because of the, the good that needs to be done. Maybe they were in awe of the fact that when this man had come off of this mat and he was carrying the mat that had once carried him, that the only thing they heard him do was to rejoice to God, to rejoice about the goodness of God and not complain about a situation. Far too long, I've heard church people, you know, when we get in these small groups of maybe at the water cooler, maybe in the vestibule area, that you hear people complaining about stuff of how things used to be. God has delivered them. God has healed them. God has taken them to new heights. But yet, sometimes we can carry a negative disposition that we begin to pour that into the people that are coming behind us. We pour it into our children and our grandchildren. Maybe you have a, a, a bad relationship or a series of bad relationships, and now you think every relationship looks like that, and you begin to tell people downstream, you tell your kids, you tell your grandkids, hey, watch out, this is no good, don't ever do this. And it's not necessarily to help them to follow what the Lord says. No, sometimes we instruct people out of our experience when it's bad. But we fail to tell them that if you worship God, God will take care of you. If you fail to honor God fully, you know, you might be missing an opportunity to see the blessings of God. You see, the Bible says that the man went away to his home rejoicing and praising. Why did he not complain about all the people that possibly neglected him? Really think about that. Why, why, did he, why didn't he have a bad attitude? Sometimes we'll have bad attitudes and disposition and we'll say, well, well, you know, I'm not feeling well or you don't know what happened to me. You don't know the story. I've met too many amazing people that have gone from th th through hell and back, but their testimony is about the goodness of God. They can't stop talking about God. I believe that that's how God wants us to be. He says that I'll, I'll, I'll bring you out. You don't have to worry about the enemy getting the best of you. You see, you got me on your side. All it takes is one person in God. That's the majority. 
And God wants us to let that to be our testimony. When you go back and look in Deuteronomy chapter 13, you'll read the story of the 12 spies going into the promised land that God had intended for his people. And as story goes, those, those 12 spies that went out, they came back, they all had part of the report was identical. And that was what God said was in the land that he had promised, it's in the land. The Bible says they were bearing some of the things and the possessions that were from the fruit of the land. They brought it back with them. So everybody said, yes, it's there. But 10 of them had a bad report. And their bad report was really about how they saw themselves. It was really about the inadequacy of their own abilities rather than the ability of the God Yahweh that was taking them to a place that they could never inhabit without his presence. And as story goes, the word of the 10, the, the, the 10 spies caused a whole nation to wander in the desert for 40 years where most of them would die. 10 people gave a bad report and a whole nation nearly died. Here's the question that I have for you. What is the report that you're giving to the people around you? What is the report that you give to the people on your job? Do you tell them about how great God has been? Or are you complaining about all the bad that's happening around you and why people are mistreating you or maybe they're not giving you the proper respect that you're due? Is it because of your report that people will live in the future, that they will live around you? or that people will die because you didn't tell them what was necessary. You see, when you look back at that story, God dealt severely with that nation. He said that I'm bringing you to a place that I have guaranteed, that I've called, I'll go and I'll fight your battles, I just need you to walk in. But they, the, the 10 brothers gave a bad report that no, the, the, we, we can't do it, we're as grasshoppers. The question I have for you is how do you see yourself? Are you drawing lines in your relationship with Christ to say that I can't go that far for Christ or I can't go and for ask, you know, forgive that other person over there or I can't go and restore that because I'm not ready for that? Are, is your life filled with, with markers and limitations as to how far you won't go to serve Christ? Or are you willing to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul that says that let that mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus? who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Jesus was not worried about his reputation because he was moving by his purpose. He said that I came in order to die that you might live. What's your purpose? Is your purpose just as my pastor used to say, is, is to pop popcorn and watch days of our lives? Is that what God wants for us? Is that the best that God has? Or is there something greater? Has God given us the Holy Spirit that you and I might walk around as supermen and superwomen and, and be the awe and the ooh of an unsaved world? Or are we to use the power of the Holy Spirit to go and to do his work, to share his gospel in places where people are not willing to go, to, to, to stand when you're not, you don't feel like standing, when you're the only one in the room trying to worship God and nobody else, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that allows you to stand. Are you willing to go that far? Are you willing to extend an olive branch to somebody that you say, you know what, they don't even deserve it? And truth be told, you might be right. But are you living for you, but are, are you living for Christ? Are you walking the life that, you're, that you died for or the one that Jesus died for? Are you trying to give him glory or are you trying to take glory for yourself? The question that I asked at the beginning of the message is, how far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to go? When you look at the scriptures of what Jesus told his disciples, he said, take nothing for you. Don't, don't, don't take a, you know, two, three suitcases. Don't, don't pack lunch for five days. He said, I'll provide for you as you go. It's something that he told the children of Israel when they were coming out of Egypt, going across the desert. He fed them daily. There was no lack. Their clothes didn't wear out. He provided for them. It's the same thing that God is telling you and I today. But we, we've got to remove the fence line. We've got to remove the boundary of how far we're willing to go for Christ. We need to make up in our minds that we are willing to go for Christ as far as he's willing to go. We will stand whenever Jesus says to stand. We will stand wherever he says to stand. 
And we will boldly proclaim the gospel. We won't just lean into the culture and just to give in. No, God is calling for a people. He's not calling for a political party. He's not calling for a specific generation. He's calling for people that are willing to live and move by his word. That you and I don't have to wait on a second and a third sign of confirmation. That the first time God speaks that we can move. And I am convinced that God has calling us to do something that people are not willing to do because it's by his spirit, not by might or strength, by his spirit. And by his spirit, we can do all things through Christ, all things. But it starts with you and I willing to take down the fence line. It starts with you and I willing to do more than just sort of check the box that we're Christian but to live the life fully. I'm convinced that the church right now in our, in our attempt to regain relevance for our young people, we're, we're trying to, in some cases, befriend our young people more than we are trying to be a pillar. Be a, be, the Bible says where we're epistles, we're books to be read of men. Instead of being a, a armor bearer or a standard, sometimes we look to say, you know what, we want to be friends to try to relate. God doesn't need a marketing manager. The, the Bible doesn't need some kind of, you know, a, a marketing strategy in order to be effective to mankind. He says, by my word, just share my word. God said, I'll do the rest. Just go and tell them that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Go and tell them that he's no longer dead. The tomb over in, in, in Jerusalem, it's empty because he's not buried there. He is sitting on the right hand of the father. Just be willing to go to be a servant of him. And I'm convinced that the life that you live will be the fullest life that God intended. And whatever obstacle, whatever struggle that comes before you, you it, it may be tough. It may be, you know, God may call us to go over it. He might remove it. But whatever his prerogative is, he'll get the glory and he will take care of us. But you and I must be willing to go. Let's offer a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity for the preaching of your word. God, we thank you for everybody that is watching today. I pray that the word lands into the hearts and souls of those that need to know, God, that you are able, that you are sufficient, that you are, are adequate enough to do anything that you call to be. I pray that those that are sick right now that are watching, God, that if it be your will to heal their bodies, that they may have a testimony to be able to talk about the goodness of the Lord, that they may be able to tell others about your greatness. God, I pray that you comfort the hearts of those that are struggling with the enemies trying to put thoughts and sow seeds of discord and relationships. Right now, we rebuke that in the name of Jesus Christ. God, that your word might stand. We give you praise and honor in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We thank you for joining uh, this broadcast today. Um, I pray that everyone is safe and maybe their leftovers from yesterday's food and fellowship. But as you plan out your Monday, I, I, I challenge you to consider how much of your Monday is going to be for Christ and how much is going to be for everything else. How much of the rest of your week you want to put a percentage on it, if you want to put a number of minutes and hours, we should be living fully for Christ. And it doesn't mean that there's, there's nothing left for you to sit back and enjoy, but our fellowship and our joy is in serving God. And God knows what we have need of even before we ask. And so we don't have to worry about making sure that we get our portion before we give God his. God says, if, if you give me just what, what was due to me, honor me and worship me, I will go before you and I will accomplish all the things that you're trying to do alone without me. If you are listening and you're watching this and you're in need of a church home, I don't know where you are in the country. I encourage you to find a healthy, well-balanced church. Find a church where you can be taught the word of God, but you can also be encouraged to read it for yourself. I believe that God has called everybody to be able to understand his word. There's enough audio tapes where you can even listen to the word. If you find yourself, maybe you can't read the words or maybe you can't read at all. There's somebody there that's willing to carry you if you're willing to be carried. God bless you. God keep you. Please stay tuned. We have a couple of messages after this message here, but I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you. God keep you. Enjoy.